Okay, so welcome back and uh, good afternoon. Uh, so hope you you are done with the previous programming assignment almost. Are are there any specific issues for you that you would like to discuss or anything like that? If not, I'll continue with uh, another important uh, uh, image processing uh, algorithm. Uh, maybe we will go ahead with this thing. Okay. So if you don't have any questions, so can I go ahead or do you have any questions? You can go ahead, sir. Okay, good. So yeah, uh, since this is an image processing laboratory, uh, knowing a canny edge detector would be really good because this is one of the very widely used edge detector despite this being proposed quite long back. Still, people use it uh, in quite a few applications. So this is what we will go through in this uh, uh, um, uh, in this uh, time. And after this, the I will give you uh, an assignment also, programming assignment on this Canny Edge detector. The good thing with this Canny Edge detector is that uh, it will touch upon various steps that you have already learned that include, for example, the Gaussian smoothing step, finding out the gradients, maybe using Sobel edge detector or something like that. And then some other clever things also it does to get reasonably good edges there. Okay, this is in this, uh, is typically robust to noise also, uh, not just in the way the Gaussian smoothing or any other smoothing operator does, but in addition to that, in the sense, where it looks into its neighborhood while uh, deciding whether a particular given pixel will be part of the edge or not. Anyways, uh, at this point, it may sound abstract to you, but hopefully by the end of this class, things should be clear to you. Right. So by the way, uh, you'll be surprised that uh, this turned out to be a master's thesis work in his master's. Uh, professor, right now, John F. Kennedy is a professor at uh, US Berkeley. Uh, but at that time, this is his master's work, a computational approach to edge detection, I2P transactions and pattern analysis in machine intelligence in 1986. Even today, this is one of the widely used edge detectors, something we should definitely know that if you are working in the area of uh, image processing. Just to give you a feel of how popular or how widely used this method is, you could see now Google Scholar. And if you type the name of this paper, which I tried just a few hours back, it is giving you around 39,000 citations for this paper. Yeah, that tells you the important thing. By the way, he did it uh, while he was part of uh, uh, MIT Artificial Intelligence Lab way back in 1983. That's the kind of background to this. And now they are rather history of this method. And now um, it has many nice features. Uh, it has been uh, mathematically shown that uh, this uh, detection is very robust to noise. The number of non-edge points can be minimized in your edge detection. And uh, it is close to the possible real edge number of uh, um, false responses can be reduced and all these things they have proven in this paper. If you are interested, you can please go through this classic paper. Uh, our, uh, our treatment of this proposed algorithm will be more on, a, on practical aspects now uh, where you could have an hands-on implementation of it and to get an intuition for it. These will be the objectives for us. Uh, rather than going into the mathematical background of it and uh, the theoretical proofs for it, okay? And so essentially, uh, this algorithm has five steps, okay? As I said, some of them, are, uh, they have clearly, they have cleverly tailor-made some of the things that were already there. And then in addition, they have also introduced some new uh, steps which made this very popular, very robust, and give you reasonably pretty good uh, edges. 
So first thing is, of course, like any other algorithm that you are doing, you will do a smoothing operation there. After you do smoothing, because you have already seen the gradient finding is rob uh, is uh, sensitive to edges, so you do some kind of smoothing, like a Gaussian smoothing. Then in the next step, you would be finding the gradients. And once you find the gradients, uh, you would do a non-maximal suppression and then followed by double thresholding and then edge tracking by hysteresis. So this way you might not be able to appreciate much if you are looking at it for the first time. But, but let us take a look at it step by step. That's what we will do now. Well, smoothing is the basic thing uh, you could do. You could play with uh, the sigma value, standard deviation of that, um, uh, which eventually you would be playing with the window size as well for your Gaussian kernel and do a bit of smoothing as a pre-processing step. Say, for example, this is your original image here on the left-hand side. And once you do the smoothing, you could get a, an image similar to this. That's the first step, okay, very simple. Our goal is to find edges, okay? So obviously, these edges are pretty much related to gradients, is it not? So essentially, you have to find out gradients. What, what are the methods that you know that can compute gradients? Do you know any methods or kernels that help you to find gradients of a given image? Sobel. Right, Operate. as simple as Sobel. Okay, Sobel gradients, you can, you, with Sobel, you can find out gradient in X separately and the gradient in Y separately. You can do that. Say, for example, these are the Sobel. Um, this you could see if an edge is here, that will find out. So this is basically horizontal gradient is found here. This will give you horizontal gradient or this is equivalent to, that is actually equivalent to vertical edge. That you can do. Similarly, this, if you look at it, this being your center, okay. Then, um, yeah, you, you just pay attention to what is your X and Y directions. So let's say this is your X direction, okay. So can you tell me if I have given you this, what is your Y direction? Well, he, this, this has been written for this Y direction. You could notice this. So I'm using correlation. So that also I need to mention somewhere if I'm doing correlation. So typically in MATLAB, if I'm not wrong, these are the directions that you would take here, right? Well, you could call X and Y. Um, well, uh, you call this as GX, let's say, this you call it as GY, okay? So, uh, well, in that case, uh, this will be slightly different. For GX and GY, tell me the vertical gradient uh, values. This is your center. Okay, anyway, the middle is zero. Tell me the top, top one, first row. You should be knowing it and it should be on top of your mind by this time. What is the first row of your vertical gradient? You are not sleepy. Yeah, what is the first row? Minus one, minus two, minus one. That's all. Minus one, minus two, minus one. This obviously then one, two, one. See here, uh, I have how do you do that? Let's say your image is F. Okay, this is your X. It's zero, zero, look, R is in. So F of EX comma y plus 2, y plus 1, right, minus f of x comma y minus 1, whole divided by 1 by 2. But here, uh, you can, that will be for the center, but again, you do a similar stuff uh, in this to these two also, so that will become f of, uh, what about this, this is equivalent to f of 
x minus 1, correct, comma y plus 1 minus f of x minus 1 comma y minus 1 plus you could write it. Okay, the other step also you could write it. Well, this normalization factor which is constant can be dropped. The reason being you are comparing anyways the strength of one pixel, the magnitude at one pixel to the other. If you drop multiplication of that uh, scaling factor for everything, then that's fine. Anyway, these are relative. So you apply this and now at the end of applying this, you know what is the value of gray at each pixel. You have one image, for example, you have an image of 100 by 100. You have now two, you can keep get, have it in two images. One gives you gradient in the x direction, 100 by 100. Make a note, here the values will be uh, floating values, okay? Non-integer values you can have, so keep that in mind. Then GY is again 100 by 100. So there are two images that you have at this point of time. Everybody with me till now? Are any question or doubt here? Is anyone having any question or doubt here? Are you fine? Yeah, do not hesitate to ask me because you are, after this, you are going to implement this. Hmm, so do not hesitate to ask me, even if you think that's a silly question. Any question? Are, is it clear to everyone? Yes, sir. Yes. Yes. Good. yes. That's good. Then I'll go ahead one more step. Now, given that, I could compute now magnitude of the gradient. And one is magnitude of the gradient and orientation of the gradient. Gx, Gy. This also we have discussed uh, in the class. So gx square plus gy square under root, square root will give you this. Well, in practice, computing the squares of these terms and then square root of that could be expensive, of course, since you will be dealing with small images, that's all right. But even now, you better use this, where you simply take absolute value of gradient of x plus absolute value of gradient of y. Okay, so uh, th this is kind of an L1 norm, similar to L1 norm, where you take the absolute value. Anyway, this is a relative comparison. That should be fine. And then to get at what angle it is, you have on one side Gx, on one side Gy. Now, can Gx and Gy, can these values be negative? Is it possible that they can take a negative value? Yes, sir. It is possible. So then, for example, GX is positive, GY is negative, assume that. Then the orientation is somewhere here, in, in the, somewhere in this fourth quadrant. I guess this is first, second, third, and fourth quadrant. Similarly, your GX is negative and GY is positive. You are in the second quadrant, so on and so forth. It can be there in any of these quadrants. So from the implementation point of view, let me here uh, highlight one point here. So suppose I give you GX and GY, and I ask you to compute the angle. How do you do that in MATLAB? I give you GX value and GY value. They are there as two different images at each pixel, isn't it? Now I ask you. An inverse of uh, GY by GX and inverse of gy by gx. Any idea on what is the command in uh, um, MATLAB? A tan inverse. A tan inverse. Huh? No, sir, a tan. A tan of gy by gx. <laughs> Will this give me in all four quadrants? Or is there any issue with that? Suppose my gx equal to 10, uh, gy equal to minus 10. gx equal to 10, 
g y equal to minus 10. I have another case where my g x equal to minus 10 and g y equal to 10. Now, by just looking at here, tell me what is theta value here? g x equal to 10 and g y equal to minus 10. What is the theta value? 45. Minus? Mm -hmm. 45. Correct. Minus 45 degrees. Very good. Then what about the other one? Same minus 45. Is it so? Look at that graph and tell me. Gx equal to minus 10 and gy equal to 10. Hmm. So minus 45 means the kind 135. of... 135. Yes, right. This is, for example, 0 to 180 probably you are considering. This probably you are considering this as 0 to minus 180 or something like that, right? You are considering. So this is equal to minus 135. This angle is 90 plus 45. So theta equal to minus 135. So when I, but what is the value of GY by GX in both cases? What is GY by GX here? Minus 1. Minus 1. So can it distinguish and give you for one minus 45 and other minus 135. How do you handle this in MATLAB? Any idea? The second angle will be plus 135, right? Yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. You're right. Yeah, plus 135. Correct. You're right. Good. That's good. So how do you handle this in MATLAB? Any idea on that? Can you shed some light on or how do you think you can handle this in MATLAB? Did anyone come across this anytime? There is some other command in MATLAB where you could give numerator and denominator separately for a tan inverse function. See, what is it that we want to do is Currently, if a tan will take a single argument where you do gy by gx and give it. Rather, what you want here is you want to separately keep track of the signs of both gx and gy. So there is one more command I want you to bring your attention to is a tan 2. I don't know whether it first takes numerator or first takes denominator. You do. You work it out. It does take two arguments. Thanks that it takes two arguments. Otherwise, its range is only over a period of pi by 2, 0 to pi by 2. Okay. So once this is there, the range would be now minus pi to plus pi it does. So what it does? Minus pi. Here is minus pi. 0. Oops, touching in wrong places. 0, pi by 2, this I could call pi, this I could call minus pi by 2, minus pi. Pay attention to all these menu details because they do matter when you are going to write a program for it and all the steps you are going to implement it. Okay, That's why these are all minor things that typically you should be able to figure out yourself. But still, given that we have some time here, I am drawing your attention uh, here. So what it does, any angle here will be, this direction will be negative, 0 to, for example, this is minus 45 degrees, minus 90, minus 135, minus pi. And these angles, it does from 0, this is 45 degrees, 90 degrees, 135 degrees, and minus pi, 180. So that is the range it gives you. It gives 8 and 2 has a range of minus pi to pi. Okay. So since I have written here, uh, I, I could, you, you could, in fact, some, it's up to you. You, know? uh, you could, in, I, I would rather prefer to have it, let's say, in between 0 to 2 pi instead of minus pi to pi. What should I do? I, I call that MATLAB algorithm. It gave me the ranges of values from minus pi to pi. I, would, I don't like that. I would rather want the values in between minus pi to pi. What should I do? How can I get that? Any idea on that?
something which is there from minus pi to pi, I want it from 0 to pi. Think about it. It's a simple thing. You just need yeah, to make pi. it there. Add hmm. pi. Hmm. What, what needs to be done? Adding pi to complete range. Uh, will that give? For example, see, I have pi by 2 here. Hmm. But this, I want the same thing. Only here, this should happen. Correct. So think about it. It's a simple shift that you are need to do only to these points. Or else, you interpret everything from minus pi to pi, unless really you need to make a shift there. That's all. That's a very simple trick. But keep this in mind. Okay. Um, yeah. Is the explanation so far clear? Or do you uh, have any questions? Yeah, uh, sir, uh, sir uh, as far as uh, MATLAB is concerned, where we went to step two, it says uh, mod of G is equal to mod of GX plus GY. So, uh, GX and GY are two images, right? That is yeah. uh, having the horizontal edge data and vertical edge data. Okay. I, rather than calling it as an image, I will call it as a matrix of the same size as the image. Yes, the sir, reason basic, why yes. I am avoiding calling it as an image is these values are floating point values. Yes, sir. So uh, we've uh, so G is basically a matrix which uh, in which we have added the horizontal and vertical edge matrices, right, sir? G is the you mean this one, huh? This one is this yeah. is a matrix in which we've just added these two matrices, right? Yeah, added absolute values of these matrices. Absolute value of these. Right. Suppose you have written this as A1 and A2. Your new A3 is, I don't know, fabs or abs, you uh, float absolute or just absolute, you, you pay attention to that. That absolute value of the first matrix of A1 plus A2. It's a single operation. You can do, don't do for don't go to each element and do it. Just do it at the matrix level. That so will now, give you the gradient. Yes. So now we've got G, sir. Right. Mm, correct. G is, also, G is also an image only, basically. We've got G. Well, G is the magnitude of the, at each pixel. Okay. If your original image is 100 by 100. Now, if you, uh, this G is also 100 by 100. If you go to a pixel here, uh, for let's say 10 by 10 pixel, here 10 by 10, that location will tell you the edge magnitude of that edge at that pixel. You can yes. see it as an image itself. Image itself. And Correct. Uh, sir, yes, after sir. this, just I have understood. Mind, yeah, just sir. keep in mind that these values are floating. That's important. Thing. Sir, so now when we find this gradient, sir, this is also a matrix. This is a separate matrix. That's all. You can store it as a matrix. That's all. So because it is of the it. same size. Na? So at each pixel now in one uh, matrix, which is of the same size as image, you are storing the magnitudes of the gradient. In another matrix of the same size as image, you are storing the orientations of that image, as simple as that. Okay, sir. So there we By will not maintain uh, the same index value across all these things. Yes, we will not take mod in that case. That is why this complexity is arising of zero. Okay. Correct, correct. Yeah, yeah. One correction here is this mod should not be there here. Right. Oh, so far that... Correct, correct. That is wrong. There should not be any mod there. Hmm? Is that fine? It is simply as I have written here, tan inverse of G Y by G X. Right, sir. So far. Right. Yeah, good. Oh, just pay attention to your orientations that are there in the image and all. Just if you are getting somewhere, um, something going uh, unexpected, pay attention to all those things. What is your GX? What is your GY? Is it the vertical axis there? And all those things, you take a look into that. Whether you are uh, doing the first, I mean, um, uh, image A of X comma Y, which is row and which is column matching or not, just pay attention there. That notation typically varies from tool to tool also. So just pay attention there. Okay. Other than that, any other question till here? Hope everyone of you is fine with this. Okay, good. So let me then take you to the next step. Okay, well, uh, this is your smooth image earlier. You have seen the original image. This is, and that's the smooth image. And after that, you applied, you computed the gradient and just plotting the magnitude of the gradient here as an image. That's how it looks like. 
because it is at the edges, you have very strong value. The rest of the places, it is depends on the edge. So smooth regions will almost be zero there. So this is what you got as a result of this. What next? What is the problem that you observe here? See, my goal is to compute, pay your full attention here. My, my purpose here is to compute the edge. Now from this, it is clear that there is an edge somewhere here. But still there is a problem along the edge or around the edge. What is the problem? Do you observe any issue with that? The edge is itself smoothed out. On the, the edge very has a thickness and it is smoothed out. Right. Very good. Very good. Excellent. So we want a thin edge there. That means... Let's say this is my gradient direction here. Once I know the edge, I know the orientation of the gradient, isn't it? So I need to thin the edge in the direction of the gradient. So this point has to get very clear. You need to get it very clearly. It is along this gradient of your edge. You just keep only that value, which is maximum among its neighborhood. But this search, we are going to do it along the direction of the gradient. Suppose when you are here, this pixel, let's say, you look at it in this direction. It is here, you look at it in this direction. Here, you look at it in this direction. Here, you look at it in this direction. In this direction, in this direction, in this direction. Good thing is, how do you get this direction from? Where from you get this direction? You get the direction magnitude. from orientation of the magnitude, orientation of your gradient. That is from where you get this information. Now, well, this orientation can be any value uh, starting from 0 to or minus, let's write it minus pi to pi itself so that you don't have to do any further modifications to your uh, result there. Just you interpret it as the way your MATLAB gives. It can be any, uh, hope you are clear with minus pi to pi convention. 0, minus pi, 0, minus pi, 0, minus pi, 0, pi any value here, for example, this is minus 45, this is minus 90, minus 135, this is minus 180. Okay. Are the, all this values is zero that way you're mentioned. Okay. Um, is that clear? So yes, it can take any value, but to see uh whether this is maximum or not typically you have in your image what are your neighbors that you have here in a given image you can look horizontally its neighbors these two will give you neighbors in the horizontal this gives me the neighbors in the vertical this gives me the neighbors who are there at plus 45 degrees or i could call it as this whatever this is minus 135 degrees or this direction. This edge could be either this or this. So those are the only neighbors I could see there. So what I will do before I do the non-maxima suppression is that I would threshold the orientations to one of the eight bins. What do I mean by that? Maybe let me write somewhere, maybe here. Zero degrees, 90 degrees, 180 degrees. Oh, I'm interchangeably using minus pi to pi and thus. So you, you follow one of them, okay? Just for convenience of explanation, uh, I'm doing that. So, this is, let's say, 45 degrees here, right? So anything 
uh, I think I, I have drawn this 45 too badly. So I have no choice than to discard that and draw it here. 45 should be at least somewhere in between. Reasonably look good. Okay. So what I will do now is anything from minus 22.5 to 22.5, I'll assign to what angle there? Because I could see only, I, I, I can look at either north, south, east, west, northeast, okay? Southwest, this is southeast, and this is northwest. These are the only neighbors I could look at. So, what I am doing now is anything from minus 22.5 to 22.5, I put it under, under 0 degrees. So, if that is the angle, I make now, now I threshold if the angle is in between minus 22.5 to 22.5. I make that to zero degrees, anything. So zero degrees is zero degrees plus or minus 22.5. That is equal to zero degrees. Now, what about this? Can you tell me what is the range of values here for this? So this is essentially my yeast here. Okay, this is for zero degrees. Now for 45 degrees, what would be the threshold that I would take here? 45 degrees. 22.5 to. Oh. Uh, so just express it in the way I did. It. Yeah, just do it in this manner. Just uh, to look it uh, easy to interpret. So anything 45 degrees plus or minus? 22.5. That's it. 22.5 degrees. I would put it as 45 degrees or here. I would call it as northeast here. Okay, and uh, anything for this is 90 degrees. So what I put as 90 degrees is anything between 90 degrees plus or minus 22.5. I keep it as 90 degrees. That's my north. And you can, uh, yeah, well, maybe I'll finish. I'll write for a few more also here. This is how much this angle is? 90 plus 45, 135 degrees. So what would be 135 degrees is 135 plus or minus 22.5, okay? That will be my Northwest. Similarly, here, uh, again, now you would understand why I'm switching between zero to 360 and all, because this makes my life easier to write. 180 degrees is 180, plus or minus 22.5 degrees. Well, you could uh, appropriately, if it is minus here, you just, figure out what is the um, offset you need to apply, then you will bring it to 0 to 360 degrees. A very simple thing. You just figure it out. Okay, that will become your vest. Similarly, how many bins are you getting overall here? How many bins are you getting total? I just wrote five, but tell me how many total, how many bins are there now? Eight, sir. Eight bins, very good. That's all. Those are all what I marked here. North, east, north, south. This is your north. North, south, east, west, northeast, northwest, southeast, and southwest. Now what will you do is, this is a very, very important step. Non-maximum suppression. Listen carefully. I'll go through the image. At a given pixel, at a given pixel. I look at its orientation. For example, you, while I am going through this whole image, I am, let's say here, my orientation is in which direction now? My orientation is, what is my orientation there? My orientation I am showing you through these graphs, okay? This could be either this, it could be this, arrow down, arrow this. Okay, I'm uh, diagrammatically representing them or symbolically representing them like this. 
these are my orientations. I go to each pixel of my image. I look at its orientation. Suppose if my orientation is north, I look at its value in both north and south. In both, why should I see both is see an edge could be a result of either a transition from bright to bright to dark or dark to bright. Both are edges. It just depends. The transition is different. So that is what will give you a different orientation. So if it is north, I would also consider south. If it is east, I would also consider west. If it is northeast, I would also consider southwest. If it is northwest, I would also consider southeast. Okay. So now I go to I carefully listen to the steps. I go through each pixel at a given pixel. I look at its dominant orientation, which is nothing but thresholded one into one of these eight bits. Assume these arrows here are telling me in which direction it is. Now, suppose this is the pixel I am there. Then what will I do? I will look at the magnitude of the gradient in this particular orientation. So, what are the magnitudes of gradients in this particular orientation? For the pixel with 5 there, which I marked with a point there. It's neighbors orientations I would see, immediate neighbors I would see, which are there in the orientation. So, which are those magnitudes of those gradients? What is the magnitude of that pixel? Gradient magnitude for that particular pixel? Five. Five. Now, in which direction is that orientation? Orientation. The, the, the gradient is vertical. Yeah. Uh, you tell me in terms of north, south, east, west, and all. In which direction it is? North. Right. Now, uh, look at its neighbors who are there in north and south. What are their intensities of gradients? Magnitudes of the gradients, not intensity of pixels. What is the magnitudes of gradients of the neighbors who are there in the north and south of it? Three in north and six in south. Correct. Now, is this maximum among these three values? Is Sorry, the value sir. no question not understood? Is the magnitude of the gradient of the current pixel that is under consideration? Is it maximum among all its neighbors in the direction of orientation of the gradient? No. It has its neighbor has three, its neighbor has six, this has only five. There is one more pixel, its neighbor, which is having a maximum value than this. So I will make this value to zero. I will not consider it as an edge. If you want an intuition for it, come back here. Here, this is, for example, you look at the thick line here. I'll see in the direction of the gradient. If it is maximum, I will keep it. If it is non-maximum, I make it to zero. Non-maximal suppression. If it is not maximum, I suppress it to zero. So what I will do here, I will make it to zero. I travel to every pixel like this, but I look at its neighbors in the direction of the gradient. See, again, I bring you back here. Here, I will not see all neighbors that are there, left, right, north, south, east, west, and all directions. How do you see? You see only in the direction of the gradient you are going to see. That is where you are thresholding it to eight bins and you are looking at. Now you tell here, for, for example, I come to this pixel now, 7. So what is the orientation? It is south. Which are the pixel values now? 5, 7, 4. The current pixel, is it maximum than 5 and 4? Yes. So I keep this. I'll go to the next one, 6. So again, north, 4, 6, 3. This is maximum among them. I keep it. Then come here. Well, uh, th this is 7. In this direction is there. Its neighbors in north and south are 6 and 2. I keep this. 
because that's the maximum. I, I can do the same for all other things also, like next five. When I come to five here, for example, this is again north. So four and three, I look at four, five, three, this is maximum. I keep that. Same six here now. Six, all I have there is six, five, four. Okay. Don't look at zero. This is the output image where you are writing. You just look at actual value there. Okay. Don't confuse that. So six, five, four. Of course, even if you see it, it doesn't matter because anyway, this is more than that. That's why you made it zero. Still, you will get the same result, of course. Okay. Uh, no, no, don't do that because if you are looking somewhere, so for example, if this is the direction you had here, assume that, then you will be looking at this. So the zeros are what you are writing into your final output image, but the comparisons are done on the magnitude images. Okay, hope that subtle difference is also clear. Okay, six, five, four, six is maximum. I would retain this. Here, again, this is north, four, seven, three. This is low, I drop that. Then three, remember, we are not looking at intensity values. We are looking at the magnitude of the gradient values here. Absolute value of GX plus absolute value of GY. So here, three, six, one, you drop it, six is more. This is in this direction. Now, you should look at this. And of course, you don't have anything here, but you look at among these two and you retain this here because this is your direction. Same, can you come here, three, three, five, that is there, you drop it, that's maximum. Four, six, six is maximum, drop it. Three, four, four is maximum, drop it. Three, one, no, no, this direction you have to see. Two is more, one is not, you drop it. This one anyway doesn't matter. Uh, it doesn't have anything, so just you drop it. The boundary pixels, just drop them. No issues with that, okay? Same if you want, I could look at the other things also. So for example, here four, five, four, two, four, five, five is maximum, you just drop it, okay? And uh, um, then uh, uh, what else? Two, three, okay? So maybe I could, uh, anyways, better you leave the boundary pixels, which are 100 by, since a small thing has been drawn there, uh, you are not able to see. Otherwise, you just ignore the boundary things. I think that's what they have done here also. So that's why if you notice here, this, 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 this would be forming your edge. So you notice here, they have kept it in white, showing this and the rest, they made it to zero. This is referred to as non-maximal suppression. A little bit tricky one, but nevertheless, if you pay attention to it a bit, you can comfortably implement this. Do you have any questions here? Uh, yes, sir, I have a question, sir. Yes, please. Sir, uh, in this image, uh, like if we just add a row, I'm just saying hypothetically, if you add a row uh, of all ones below this three, four, three, one, one row, hmm. of all ones. And if we take the middle uh, column, which has the values five, seven, four, three. So, five, in the seven, three. so in the first iteration, sir, amongst five, seven, and four, seven will get selected, five and four will become zero. See, when we are seeing it for the first time. Just one thing you be clear is, whichever pixel you are going through in the image, you either retain it or make it zero. You will not play with others. Okay, right. Oh, this is a very, very important point. Otherwise, your algorithm ends up nowhere. Exactly. Because... Because then we can't compare it to the next. Uh, <laughs> yes. yes, because you do not know who their neighbors are, how good it is. Or okay. you don't even know in which orientation it is there. Consider that this is in this orientation. Huh? And then maybe Perfect. this value is just two and this value is two. Then you would, in fact, retain this pixel. Yes, yes. Now I understand. Right. Very good. Very good. That's an important question where most of us have a good chance of committing a mistake. That's why I repeat the algorithm. Hopefully, I, I wish I have it somewhere, some text also. See, yeah. Uh, maybe I will just let us read it and hopefully if there is any correction required here, let us do that. The purpose of this step is to convert the blurred edges in the image of the gradient magnitudes to sharp edges. Blurred one is becoming sharp because you are looking in the gradient direction and just keeping that which is 
having the maximum intensity. Basically, this is done by preserving all local maxima in the gradient image. You are just looking locally, either top bottom or left right or plus 45 degrees and maybe uh, in the same gradient. How do you call it? This is, let's say, 180 plus 45 degrees or 90 plus 45, 135 degrees and this is 270 plus 45, 315 degrees. So you are looking by looking at the local minima. The algorithm is for each pixel in the gradient image. Pixel after pixel, you will be applying. What you do? Round the gradient direction theta to nearest 45 degrees. That's what you are doing. 0, 45 degrees, 90 degrees, 135, 180. Then what? 180 plus 45, whatever it is. Okay, 180. My math should be better. 225, then 270, 350. Okay, you nearest you so you do this threshold first to theta directions the the same matrix you could modify and then for the rest you use that uh, uh, rounded uh, the one where you have rounded it to nearest 45 degrees you use that okay that's what has been done as the second step then what you do compare the edge strength of the current pixel with the edge strength of the pixel in the positive and negative gradient directions. So if you are here, this is if this is your direction, this is your positive and this is your negative. If you are in this direction, this is your positive and this is your negative. If you are in this uh, or something else, if you are in this direction, maybe I have scribbled too much there, so let me draw here. If you are in this direction, this is your positive, this is your negative. So what, are, what is it that you are going to do? Compare the edge strength of the current pixel with the edge strength of the pixel in the positive and negative directions. That is, if the gradient direction is 90 degrees, compare it with pixels to the north and south. Okay. If the edge strength of the current pixel is the largest, preserve the value of the edge strength. If not, suppress, that is, remove the value. That's all. You do then repeat it. This you do only for the current pixel that you are visiting. Don't touch the other pixels. They'll be taken care by only looking at what is your direction of the gradient for that particular pixel. Then only you are going to do that. Is non-maximal separation step clear? Any questions or doubts here? Sir, I have one doubt, sir. In the yes, yes. 5743 column, uh -huh. Uh, five seven, suppose seven, if two. this has become so column. badly written so let me clear it off okay in five seven in the middle one. column okay okay this uh, column yes, okay uh -huh. yes sir uh, if suppose all the magnitude values are equal that what we should do sir yeah suppose say, all the values are five see, well that will not typically happen see again these are floating values Huh, how are you getting that g equal to square root of absolute value of gx plus absolute value of gy you are doing it. So then you cannot, that's a very rarely that occurs. If that is there, it will retain as that whole thick edge itself. Unfortunately. But even if even by a decimal value, if it is different, that's good enough. And that will indeed happen because First, you are applying the uh, smoothing. With the smoothing, you are taking the whole image, unless your image is very constant and a very special case, that will not happen. So because you are blurring it, while blurring your window, you are sliding around each pixel, that will bring some change there. Followed by that, you are doing this calculation of uh, GX dy using Sobel, that also will bring a change there. So it will... That is a very, very unlikely situation uh, where something is, uh, you specially tailored your image to do that. Otherwise, it, that does, doesn't come. And again, these are not intensities. These are gradients, which are floating values. So even a decimal change there will take care of that. Is okay, that okay? Sir, sir yeah. and one more thing uh, is hmm. the non-maximum suppression count we are doing uh, to find the very Thick line, sorry, very thin line. Yeah. To thin your edges because see, you are applying Gaussian smoothing. Even you, you, when you are applying this, uh, so 
Sobel edge detector, we, as we discussed in the class, there is some weighted average going on, there is some smoothing is there, okay? Uh, but you cannot really avoid Gaussian smoothing. Otherwise, you would get a lot of spurious noise. And all these things will eventually result in having blurred edges or another name for it is these thin edges, thick edges. So you want to make it thin. That's why you are doing it. And one more thing, sir, if you uh, hmm. go, uh, go to the step three, uh, that image ah. uh, in the same middle middle column mm. uh, first uh, in place of five if it is a uh, um, 15 then mm. at the end it is a 13 then we should uh, we will not get the continuity line uh, continuous line right yeah. continuity is another step that is going to come in uh, uh, come in canny edge detector that's what i will discuss after this very good point Continuity mm -hmm. of edge is not taken so far into account in this algorithm. Now the next steps will take care of that. That's one of the elegant and very um, yeah, very smart step that has been introduced in the canny edge detector. Okay, sir. Thank you. Sir. Yeah. Any other questions or doubts? Okay, so hope it is now clear to everyone. If so, we will move on to the couple of steps more are there, which makes it so powerful. Right, let's see here. These are the, now we started with this image. You have smoothed in it, you got this. And on this, you have played gradient, you got this. You realize that, that there are thick edges. So this is where you were. Then, you did edge thinning using non-maxima suppression and you ended up here. But as one of you has have rightly point, has rightly pointed out, the continuity of edge is not something taken care here. Because of some added noise, what could have happened is something which is a potentially an edge would have missed. And not all the time, the gradient alone could faithfully represent an edge. On the other hand, in practice, when you say edge is kind of a contour of your object, you would expect some continuity in that. And that's exactly to deal with that. They apply now, see earlier, even in segmentation, how did we handle segmentation earlier? There is one threshold there. Okay, below which you can make it zero, above which you consider it as an edge. But the smart step that has been introduced in canny edge detector is this idea of double thresholding. That means I have a threshold, low threshold, THL, let me call it, and threshold high. What it does is, this is a, any, magnitude of the gradient this is these thresholds are not on intensity values but on on what will you apply thresholds on magnitude of gradient right magnitude of gradient if any magnitude of gradient if it is less than this if your value is less than this low threshold this is not an edge at all. This is not an edge. And anything which is greater than this high threshold is a definitive edge or you call it as a strong edge. And any value in between this low threshold and high threshold, you refer to it as a potential edge. Potential means if I say, that uh, if I say one of your names and if I say that you have the potential okay, um, to get the highest marks in the class, but uh, that also means you may get or you may not get, but if you study well, if you, if you focus well, if you dedicate yourself well, then you could get the best mark, you could get the S, you have the potential to get S grade in the lab, if I say that. That doesn't mean you will definitely get the S grade. It only means that it has you have a good chances. And if you apply yourself, 
and do well, then you can get it. If somebody doesn't have the material itself uh, uh, or uh, uh, doesn't have the capabilities completely, they are missing it, then you, can, you will not consider that. But when you say the potential is there means it can go this way or that way, but if he applies himself, it can go this way. So potential edge, if you want me to maybe make it more intuitive, I would call it as a suspect edge, suspected edge. Okay, when you call somebody as the suspect, that means he could be the he could be the one who did it or might not be also. Okay, so it is both ways are possible. So, but if it is, he is not, if it is less than, there is no suspicion this is not at all an edge. If it is more than high threshold, then of course this is part of your edge. So, you know, you have two in your images. Now you have a list of suspected edges and a list of strong edges. Now the goal now is to decide whether the suspected edge is a strong, is a part of just to, since these are all edges, I'm calling the other one as a strong edge. When I say strong edge, this is for sure an edge, okay? So I have in the class, something had happened, okay? Don't take it literally, but assume that uh, there are some strong criminals. I confirmed criminals are there in the class. But there are few people who are suspected criminals, okay? And there are people who are, uh, who have no record of any criminal activities. Now, what could be one way that you decide whether the suspect is really a criminal or not? What could be a possibility? You will look at whether he is a friend of a confirmed criminal, whether they had traveled um, together, whether uh, they are sharing quite a few things and they are good friends. A suspected criminal who is a friend of a definitive criminal who is having a good track record and established himself as the criminal you will put this guy into other basket. There is another guy in the class. So you look at the friends of the suspected criminal. All his friends have a clean history. All of them have a clean history and character. So then what will you do this with the suspected criminal? What is the decision you will take with him? Not, not, a, yeah, not a criminal. It. That's it. This is exactly what you do with edges also. You have a strong edges. And now look at here. This is our output you got with non-maximal suppression. The one which is shown in white. So for displaying what you could do is zero is black, no edge. That means those are the pixels whose magnitude of gradient is less than the low threshold. Now, those greater than threshold, you make it to one. Okay, that's what you see in that white color. Now, there are suspected edges are there. That's what you could perhaps, you need to display these images, these kinds of images for your work also. So, uh, that's why I'm telling you how you could create the second image. Put a 0 0.5 value in those images there for the, those pixels, which are kind of suspected edges. Now, next step to do is to iteratively go through each pixel of the image. If it is zero, nothing needs to be done. If it is zero point, uh, if it is one, nothing needs to be done. If this guy is having, if this pixel is having a value of 0 0.5, look at its neighbors. Look at its neighbors. If it is connected by any chance, to a strong edge. If one of its neighbor is having a strong edge, put this guy as also, convert this guy as a strong edge. That's what you are going to do here. So one thing, so here, just let's read it also, just to ensure because you need to implement it. So we need to go about every nitty gritty detail of this. The edge pixel remaining after non-maximum suppression step are marked with their strength pixel by pixel. So that time you have all these um, continuously varying values out there. 
Many of this will probably be true edges in the image, but some may be caused by noise or color variations, for instance, due to rough surfaces. The simplest way to discern between these would be to use a threshold so that only edges stronger that a certain value would be preserved. The canny edge detection algorithm uses double thresholding. Edge pixels stronger than the high threshold are marked as strong. Edge pixels weaker than the low threshold are suppressed. And edge pixels between the two thresholds are marked as weak. The effect on the test image with thresholds of 20 and 80 are shown in figure. So that's on this image, they have kept a, anything less than 20, they made it to zero. In between 20 and 80, these are the ones which you see as gray here. Anything greater than 80 is made strong here. So that's till here, the step of double thresholding is done. So what is the next step is done is, this is referred to as hysteresis. Now, hopefully I have some explanation somewhere to this also. I wish, maybe not, okay, but you could somewhere you could figure out. Uh, so what you will do now is you go to each pixel. What I'm trying to recollect is, should you look at in all directions when you do hysteresis thresholding or should you look at only in the directions of the gradient. That's what I am thinking. No need to look into the direction of gradient because that's for thinning and also that that will anyway, nothing will be there if you are looking in the direction of gradient that you have already done. So all you do is you go through each pixel. No, I hope you all figured out why I eliminated that choice because anyway, that you have done, you done earlier and only non-maximal suppression, you did it. So you go through each pixel, look at all its maybe how many, eight neighbors. And if any of those neighbors are strong, you make this one also to be a strong edge. You, you go through this image once and probably you need to iteratively do this if I'm not wrong. Yeah, uh, Sindhura uh, or uh, Vaishnavi, do you remember? I think you need to do it iteratively. You will not simply drop it if it is not stronger. Can any of you by any chance remember that? Um, hmm? Hmm, Vaishnavi, do you remember? Can you hear me, sir? Yes, we can hear you, Vaishnavi. Yes, sir. So, so uh, on, this, on the stronger one we will see right if it is hmm. if it is having uh, Only uh, the, then we yeah. will see the neighborhood and if right. there is any one strong any one uh, uh, weaker edge then we will consider it as a stronger edge can you repeat okay. yeah Sir, uh, okay, well uh, uh, the way you are saying is uh, you look at each uh, stronger edge, and if there is any connected exactly. edge to that, any weak edge connected to that, you make it strong. Yeah, exactly. Right. But uh, is it not that you need to do it iteratively because now something else has become stronger edge? This will have again some things, right? So you repeatedly do this, right? You keep a track of all strong edges. For each so, one, uh, you will, go. They will be uh, they will be separate images, right? Like, correct, correct. No, what I'm saying is, see, uh, hope you guys are following what I'm telling here. Suppose I have one to 10 strong edges are there. There is uh, some 10 pixels have strong edges. I look at all neighbors of this no, strong no, no, edge. Sir, no, sir. no, no, no. Uh, so once we make uh, the weaker edge a strong edge, we don't hmm. uh, see the uh, neighborhood of the strong edge again. You don't see it? That's uh -huh. what I'm doubtful. Let's uh, let's try to look at that. Uh, I no sir. I, um, no. Let's quickly see. That's what I don't remember. It has been more than a year. I have studied it. <laughs> so let me see that. Sorry for that. Uh, thinning of edges is done. Okay. Uh, process Gaussian filter tracking. Um, 
double threshold edge tracking. This is what we will see. So far, the strong edge pixels should certainly be involved in the final edge image as they are extracted from the true image edges. However, there will be some debate on the weak edge pixels as these pixels can either be extracted from the true edge or noise color variations. To achieve an accurate result, the weak edge caused by the latter so, reason should be removed. Usually a weak edge is caused by true, uh, to track the um, is applied by looking at which and its eight connected L. As long as there is one strong edge that is involved in the block, the weak edge point can be identified as one that should be preserved. Okay, they are not doing it iteratively, uh -huh. correct? It's only it's one it's because uh, once we make that as a strong edge, anyway, right. in its neighborhood, there will be a strong edge, right? Right, right. Fine. No, the point is uh, now in its neighborhood, there could be another weak edge. So again, see, again, let me uh, clarify one more thing also here. There are many variants and improvements to uh, the scan edge detector. So whatever the second approach I have mentioned, it is very likely if it is not there earlier, it could have been there in the latter uh, uh, methods proposed as an improvements to can edge. Okay, hoping that that will improve. But for us, for you guys, I'll keep. We will keep it simple. Okay, that also looks like the original can edge detector. You do one thing. You go through each weak edge. If that weak edge has any, look at all the eight neighbors of that weak edge. If any of those neighbors is a strong edge, make it as a strong edge. Make it as an edge. Okay, Strong edge is anyway an edge. Weak edge, uh, edge also, you make it as okay. an edge. Sir, I think we iterate to the strong edge and look for the weaker neighborhoods, I think. Anything will be the same. Okay. Because anyway, the neighborhood you are looking at, ah, right? right, right. So yes. both are same. You can do it either ways. So you have a set of weak edges in one image, one image you store it. Wherever there is a weak edge, look at its eight neighbors. If any one of those neighbors is a strong edge, make this as an edge. Is everyone clear with that? Are any confusion? So this is the double thresholded image. Sir, after you step four, uh, can ah. I repeat it again? What yeah, right. I need to do? This is what you got as a step four. After that, you got this double thresholded image, correct? Now, what you had is two images now, okay? One is having suspected edges. Okay, both are SE. Uh, so let me call it as weak edge or strong edge. Weak edges in one image you have. So if it is a weak edge, you just keep one here just to keep track of whether it is a weak or strong. In another image, um, you have if it is a strong that pixel is a strong edge have one there or else zero that's how you could keep track of them now what you will do is you go through this image of suspected edges if a given pixel is a suspected edge look at its neighbors and see if by any chance any of its eight eight or any one of its eight neighbors is a strong edge if so, you convert this as part of your edge. If not, drop it. Am I clear? Yes, sir. Yes. So, uh, from if you want it from the implementation point of view, I can put it this way. You have suspect, suspected edge, one thing. Okay. Another thing, I could, of course, do it in single image also by giving 0 0.501, huh? that is also very much can be done with a single image. For illustrative purpose, I'm telling you it this way, you can do it either this way or in same image, if its value is 0 0.5, look at its neighbors. If any of the neighbor is having uh, one value, then you convert it into one or else keep it 0 0.5. Finally, those with one will only be there. Okay, suspected edge, strong edge, final edge. Okay, let me write it this way. Just for an illustrative purpose, right now I'm putting it this with this terminology and with this kind of illustration, which otherwise can be actually done with a single image itself. See, all strong edges anyway are edges. So in the edge final edge map, I will make them one here already to begin with. Now I am here. So these are all zeros, for example. I don't care about that. I got in suspected edge one here. So that pixel is let's say here. 
I look at this this pixel in the three by three neighborhood of that pixel. I'll see in the strong edge and see even if there is just one one edge, one of its neighbor is strong or not. I will see from here. Okay, here if it is zero, it is not there. If it is one, it is strong. So at least one of this neighbor has value one in the strong edge category. I will look at it when it is a suspected edge. If it is not a suspected edge, if it is zero there, nothing to do, nothing to worry about. If so, I will make it into strong. So here, if it is so, I will make here it one. I will make it into, I will put it in the final batch. I will make it as one. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Okay. Now I will tell now, given that this is clear, let me illustrate that with a single image also I can do it. No need of uh, having uh, uh, three images also. What I will do here, I, I, I mark here 0, 0, 0, 0. These are all no edge. I have 0 0.5 here. Then I have 1, 1, 0 0.5, 1, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5. Okay, maybe somewhere here 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5. I want some weak edges. What I will do, if it is 0, 0, anyway, I will not touch it. I will come here. This is 0 0.5. I look at 3 by 3. I look at here, there is 1. So I will simply make it in my output. I make it 1. Okay, then I will just, I have another copy of it where I will make this to 1 here. At least two images is fine. Unless I am iteratively doing it, I will make it 1. You could think of various ways of implementing it. This is another way. Instead of having two copies, one suspected and strong in the same image, you have 0 0.5 for suspected, one for strong. And that's all. This is what had happened there with this one. Those which are in green color have got the conversion or upgradation from the potential edges to strong edges because you could see that they are connected to I am afraid this at least this image from this image I interpret that they are doing it repeatedly uh, but well you get a different output slightly see here when I just zoom in See, all this thing had gone into strong edge. So that's why, as I said, there could be different variants of it also. So let me. So let's go to hysteresis. Transforming weak pixel into strong ones if and only if at least one of the pixels around the one being processed is strong one. So see how he is implementing it. If it is weak, okay, you look at whether i plus one, j minus one. What does that mean? So the, the diagonal one is strong or all the eight he is looking at. If any of them is strong, he make it, and as Vaishnavi rightly mentioned it, they are not doing it iteratively. They are not adding it as a strong edge and doing it. They are simply writing it finally into Yeah, but uh, if you notice here, this upgradation is in a way there because if you are going through here, for example, uh, just notice here, if it is a weak edge, hmm, that means what they said and implemented are slightly different. Suppose one of them is strong. This is made strong. 
But if the next one is weak, for that now this becomes an hyper. They are not doing it iteratively, uh, but still to an extent this has been done. Hope somebody agrees with me. Hope somebody is able to see what I am seeing there. Sir, if we do iteratively, mm. uh, there is no need to do iterative. We just consider as a weak edge yeah. as a strong edge, right? Correct. No, you can do it. Yeah, just you could end it up there. But if you notice here, this implementation is not exactly what the... See, suppose there is I comma J is a weak edge here. Mm. So what they are doing here, if one of the neighbors are strong, they are making it strong here. But now consider... Uh, I'm at the second row, but when I come to the third row, this strong edge also will be, they are writing into it in the same image. So they are going in one round, but the there is a, some real-time updation, upgradation that is happening here. You can follow in similar line here. So I you, you just do that. It's again, as I said, there are many possible variants. This is a kind of a hybrid one. In that same go, if they are seeing it, they are doing it. Otherwise, they are not doing it. So you could do it in either ways. Okay, there is no single way of doing it. I just put it here. So just take a look into it. If you look at a different implementation or a version, they may do it differently. But here at least, uh, next time for the next row, this becomes strong. And if it is strong, the, if the one which is weak be just below that, since this is already made strong, now this weak also will become strong. Okay, it's like uh, you are a like why to say you I am a suspected criminal. My friend is let's say is also a suspected criminal. What happened is it is found that uh, he, he he has a connection with a confirmed criminal. So he became confirmed, but the moment he became confirmed, I will also become confirmed because it is converted into the other way around. Whether this is iteratively done or not is the question. But um, if you look at this image, at least it looks like they have done it. As you could see here, see these points otherwise would not have become part of this image if they have not done iteratively. Okay, you give it a try. You just, uh, so uh, they were partially doing in this implementation that we have seen here, okay. But you could die uh, in similar lines. I'm okay whether you do it uh, fully or in this manner. As I said, there is a, uh, the, it started with Kani and then uh, even Sobel is not part of Kani. But now the process is what we are, the steps that, is, that are of interest for us. So we still call it Kani. Same thing, there will be, if it, this hasn't been proposed by Kani, then I'm sure there will be another algorithm where they would have proposed to do it iteratively. That's all. Okay. So, uh, yeah, that's all. I'll stop there for this scanning. Any questions? Or, yeah, did it? I mean, such a discussion is maybe, although it's not one single answer I told, but in a way, it is good. You would realize how things could be varying and what all different possibilities are there. So, if this is clear to you, I'll just go and give a brief, uh, um, uh, uh, brief description of the actual assignment you have to do. Is that fine? It is slightly longer today, but I think it is worth knowing Kani is worth spending some time to know the Kani. Okay, are you guys fine? Uh, yes, sir. Finally, we do it iteratively or uh, uh, only for one iteration? Only for one iteration, but do it in okay. this, at least in this manner that I showed you, where I uh, shared yes, you the sir. link with... Oh, see, yes. uh, hope you are able to interpret the code along with me um, there. See what this guy is doing. Oh, hope you are all able to follow what he is doing there. See what this guy is doing is you are going through each row. He is going through each column. If it is weak, okay, then what he will do, he will look at his eight neighbors if any of them is strong, see R, 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 because one of them strong is good enough, he'll make them, he'll make him strong. Otherwise, he'll make him weak. And once he is there, he is writing into the same image, IJ, he is writing it. Then what would happen? For example, the next pixel in the same row, next pixel, when it comes, he is no more weak now. 
next pixel also could be weak, but now his neighbor has become strong. So if that guy is weak, he'll now become strong. So you do it in this manner. That is good enough. Okay, sir. Now, those of you who want to do it with more perfection, that can be done. All you need to do is you need to also keep track of whether you have visited each strong edge that you added now. If you look at it, once something becomes uh, strong, you would look at it, say, whether you have visited it, you will do this process until and unless you visited every pixel that has been marked as strong or promoted from weak to strong that you will do. Anyway, this is good enough. Okay, this snippet is good enough. You do it this manner to keep things simple. Hmm? Is uh, that clear? Excuse me, sir. Yes, sir. Sir, in this iterative method that you have just told us to do, uh, the chain will only break. Yeah, maybe let me clarify this. This is not an iterative method. It only is a real-time update is there. In the same iteration, if that is uh, strong, I will later consider, I am replacing that value in the, in the actual image itself. That is all I am doing. When you say iterative means you repeat it until there are no more changes. There is no such for while there is no while uh, I should have one, one more loop on top of it while uh, uh, while at least one strong pixel is yet to be visited or something like that I should do it that I am not doing uh, this is so, not iterative okay, right uh, uh, in this present code that you have just shown us sir if we implement hmm. it like this only in MATLAB hmm. then uh, basically the chain will break only if a particular pixel is surrounded by all zeros only then okay. will it break otherwise it will not break it yeah, will continue yeah. with the, that it will keep linking Right. No, not only that, if everything is surrounded by weak also, it will break. At least one strong should be there. See, maybe ah, I Sorry, will... sorry. At least one strong, but sir, ah, why I am right. saying zero is See, because it is continuing from chain prior. Right. Those right. weaks will maybe be becoming I, strong, yeah. right? Maybe I'll explain it this way. Uh, what will happen now with that piece of code is, suppose I have at one pixel 0 0.5, 0 0.5, uh, 0 0.5, one here okay 0 0.5 i refer to weak okay uh, 0 0 0 0 0 0 okay 0 0 now what will happen when i am coming to this row now this will be replaced by one so this would become strong since i am updating in the same image what will happen to this now It will also become one. It will have anyways become very, one because that one is very, there. Very on good. That is all the difference. If you are writing it into a separate image, that will be dropped. Now you will, this will become one. And now what will happen to this? This will also become one. That's one. exactly what I said, sir. In case there is a, a nine by three by three of all zeros, only hmm. then will it will the chain break. Otherwise, the chain will not break. You cannot say that. Because in this three by three, this somewhere outside this, see, this can uh, this can get triggered by the one which is next to it, right? So this pixel, this three by three, nothing might be there. Because, yeah, I, I understand your question. I'll just give you a counter example to you. So maybe here, 0 0.5 here. Hmm. So 0, 0, 0 0.5, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. This 3 by 3, there is nothing there, but assume that there is 1 here. So this will trigger this now. This will become 1 now. Once this becomes 1, this can become 1. So you cannot simply say 3 by 3 as such around a given pixel. Is that answering your question? Yes, it's answering my question. My statement was three by three of all zeros. Right. Kernel right. of all zeros. Yeah. Zero means you don't even have to worry about that. Zero will remain as zero. Only then will the edge uh, sir, You will visit sir, suppose those with value of 0 0.5. Zero will remain zero. One will remain one. It is only 0 0.5. It can either get upgradation or degradation. I have understood. Thank you. Good, good. Yes. Yes, someone else is asking. Rajesh, I uh, think. Yeah. Sir, suppose if the one is uh, in the fifth 
fifth row then yeah. above uh, above but all pixels and won't change only yeah. after the pixels only will change that is what yes 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 okay. that is where I, i it could have been a better way you could actually keep track of which got changed and you could you could go back and see also that is possible which we are not doing in the current implementation that i mentioned hmm? that's what you are asking right rajesh ah yes sir good correct so there is yeah yeah uh, the slides i will do uh, the one request was to share the slides this i will do and then uh, previous lab sheets yeah, i think they will do soon uh, the corrections and they will share the lab sheets okay okay clear so far so can i move on to the lab exercise if every all of all of these things are clear to you yes sir yes sir okay. yeah good yeah good thing with the lab is it will give me some breathing space and could go at our own pace no no need to means even if it extends a bit of course you will get tired me too but that's fine that's okay right so don't worry about this algorithm now i have explained you clearly all you need to do now is i'll show you this figures um this is this is one image that has been given added noise here you are asked to find out here horizontal edges and vertical edges you need to find out you know it just by orientation also so just keep what you do is any edge which is there in other bin you simply drop it that's how you could show the horizontal edges so that's the additional thing you have to do in addition to finding out the edges there this is another thing there are no other edge all the edges in these images are either horizontal or vertical okay so some, with some noise just to see how it works uh, uh, i think noise is quite high here but hopefully it works i hope think i yeah, r t s have already so do we tried need to find the magnitude of edge or uh, separately horizontal no, and vertical the magnitude of edge you will do uh, for all throughout in your calculations to figure out whether it's a strong edge or weak edge should you retain it or not but finally while you are displaying Im images you just show which of them are edges that's all no there is no distinction it is almost like a binary image that you will be showing see here these are all binary images that you are showing at the end but yes, to yes. arrive at here you need magnitudes and all this stuff hmm? is that clear yes sir okay. so then uh, uh, yeah this is an image where you have this i don't think i can draw here unless i download this okay that that's okay so yeah you could see my cursor right yeah see this uh, if i ask you to mark only those edges which are at an angle of 45 degrees so that means these edges right how do you do that now use scanny edge detector the question is like this use scanny edge detector to label those edges which are there at an angle of 45 degrees that means it also means 225 degrees also so how do you do how can you modify your canny edge detection algorithm to achieve that target any ideas about that a simple tweak to your canny edge detection algorithm would enable me to get only these diagonal edges what is that tweak we only consider 45 degree angle bin in the non suppressing sal if your orientation is 45 do you have a bin for 45 degrees plus or minus 22.5 and you have a bin for 40, uh, 180 plus 45 225 plus or minus 22.5 if your pixel is falling into these bins only you remain the keep the magnitude otherwise you simply make the magnitude of your gradient to zero that's all this is the only additional couple of lines of code you have to write to get these edges similarly you can get these edges also this will be of course this angle okay again pay attention to gradient angle versus edge angle these are perpendicular 
that's all you have to do with this with noise and with that you could in one way you could get these edges there could be another instance where you could these get these edges any other picture is also there yeah this is another picture picture they have given so let's go through this lab sheet and what exactly uh, has been asked here image with only and horizontal perform an experiment on this image having lines that are vertical and horizontal you perform the experiment natural image distinguish the result of your with okay they have not written their um, uh, uh, vaishnavi uh, uh, shall we make a modification one thing is they can show edges there just add this step also there mm, uh, we will give them two weeks of time not just one week to implement that let them show only the diagonal edges that uh, you may please add there this part also for one of the images it is good enough just add it to let's say uh, these two images they can of course once they write it they can run on any other things this it will work as well as this also it will work for so for this and this image uh, you make a small modification there one more um, one more sub problem you give where you would ask them to display edges that are there at an angle of plus or minus 45 degrees mm, please add that hope that that should be fine vaishnavi or sindura i think they are still there ah sindura are you there yeah ah uh, yeah uh, hope that it, yeah yeah. Yes. yeah okay okay this is possible to add right yeah just add one more uh, sub problem where we will ask them to show these edges okay that's all you have to do oh. okay um, a, um any questions or comments on that this is again just a description don't worry about that i'll immediately uh, upload this video also and along with the slides you go through them and see the discussion and uh, that's all you do it there will be one more added here part e will be given to you and you will get uh, two weeks now so that will come to march 10th or uh, yeah march 10th you will get okay and that's a good enough time to implement that again maybe this will take maybe four five hours of time because you need to and again now don't need to use your own uh, sobel edge detection and gaussian filtering just use the inbuilt ones don't use canny be built in one i'll ask uh, here to add uh, something in one of them where you there is a command canny also there you just compare your result with canny edge detector just to see how good it compares with that that's all you do okay any questions on that and what needs to be done is that fine yes sir okay good i think it has been a long day for me also uh, with one class there and almost one and a half hour now so yeah if there are no questions i'll uh, stop here and uh, there are, as i said there is no no hopefully next let me check my calendar once uh, there is no need your submission will be two weeks from now and uh, how am i placed next week yeah next week we do have a lab so i will probably ask you uh, each one of you some uh, viva kind of stuff now i think we have covered some good number of weeks maybe four weeks or five weeks how been it has been four sir, to five i think weeks. we have uh, exams from march 9th yeah so what i am saying is for uh, uh, on third march third this is just like a viva on what you have done on programming yes okay sir just on the lab okay, oh, so whichever has been discussed since you have already done those things uh, i'm sure if you just spend 2 uh, 3 hours of time should be usually good enough since you have uh, spent quite some time with the labs i'll just restrict to the lab and whichever i have given as assignments to you programming assignments on that i will ask you some basic questions maybe uh, not sir not uh, one more thing uh, can we use uh, um, sobel inbuilt command uh -huh. yeah go ahead and you have been given license now to use the uh, sobel inbuilt command because anyway um i guess every one of you had already implemented the sobel edge detector on your yourself so now you do have the license to use it here just that don't use canny you will get the license after submission of this programming assignment you will get the license to use inbuilt command for canny 
till then you could use the rest like uh, sobel you could use gaussian filtering you could use uh, any correlation and all you want to do somewhere you just use it those things you could now use the inbuilt commands mm, now it is the focus is more on how you implement uh, and stitch together nicely all these steps and uh, bring the desired output excuse me sir yes sir sir in this uh, viva on third sir mm -hmm. uh, it is uh, what is the pattern as in you will be having one to one class you will ask yeah, questions i will just i i would like to interact with each of you maybe uh, not more than 10 minutes perhaps Verbally. on an average i would uh, talk to you guys each one of you um, each one of you individually okay um, yeah, uh, so i yeah i think from then they had some bad internet connection from there that's fine so yeah so i will uh, i'll keep you guys in uh, uh, all of you in the waiting room i'll call I, i'll admit one by one and just interact with i'll ask you some very basic questions on these things uh, um, for on an average 10 minutes per student okay okay sir. right and uh, um, it's not like I last the content uh, from all the topics that I taught in the MLIP course. It is more about the lab, whichever we discussed in the lab or whichever programming assignments you have done as a part of this lab. Yes, sir. Yes. Right. Okay. Yeah. Good. Any other questions, comments, doubts? Okay, then. See you guys next week. Mm, have a Nice remaining week and nice weekend and see you guys in the next week. Bye. Take care. Thank you, sir.